Welcome back. Today we'll discuss the biomechanics of soft tissues. Unlike bones and teeth, almost all solid tissues are soft in that they can experience large deformations and strains under their normal working loads without failing. Many soft tissues have primarily or dominantly mechanical functions. Examples include skin and blood vessels, ligaments and tendons, pericardium and heart valves, skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. Many other tissues with other primary functions may nonetheless be affected by mechanical forces such as uh, the stomach, intestines and esophagus, the lungs, the kidney and the liver. So one way to classify the properties of soft tissues is to break them up uh, for example, into their biological properties, their structural properties, and their mechanical properties. Because many of the biological properties of tissues are important in biomechanics. First of all, biological tissues are dynamic. They grow, remodel, and adapt. They can be injured, but they can also heal. They grow in a hypertrophy, proliferate, undergo necrosis or cell death and apoptosis. They actively contract and they undergo locomotion. Tissues are also compartmentalized. They have intracellular structures and organelles. They're organized into cell matrix units, such as alveoli, for example, in the lung. Uh, they maintain electrochemical balance. And finally, uh, tissues being living are responsive to the environment. So the principle of homeostasis applies, and they have signal transduction mechanisms to detect and respond to changes in their external environment. So there are many interesting, important biological properties that make soft tissues different from engineering materials. Soft tissues also have complex structural properties. They are complex composites consisting of cells and basic functional units of cells and extracellular matrix, typically of more than one cell type. They are highly hydrated and the water content of most soft tissues is between 65 and 85 percent by volume. The water itself is compartmentalized. There are intracellular extracellular or interstitial compartments, vascular and lymphatic uh, water compartments. And as a result, uh, the hydrostatic pressure in the water and the fluid flow of the water in the tissue contribute to the mechanical properties. Tissues have an organized hierarchical microstructure that's important to their function and mechanical properties. They also have irregular three-dimensional geometries and they're intrinsically difficult to test. Finally, I'll separate the mechanical properties into those that could be considered elastic and those that are intrinsically not elastic or anelastic. First of all, as we've mentioned, soft tissues undergo large or finite deformations, meaning that we need to use the finite strain tensors. They have non-linear stress-strain relations. Their mechanical properties are anisotropic meaning that they differ in different directions, and inhomogeneous, meaning that they are different in different places in the tissues. In general, we could say that the properties of soft tissues are determined by their microstructure. In addition to those properties of soft tissues, there are other properties that cannot be approximated with elasticity. So these anelastic properties include creep, relaxation, and hysteresis and strain rate dependence. And together, all of these properties are viscoelastic properties. Creep refers to the property whereby a step increase in stress results in a time-dependent increase in strain. Relaxation or stress relaxation refers to the property whereby a step increase in strain 
is followed by an increase in stress that decays over time. Hysteresis refers to the property of materials whereby the stress-strain curve for loading and unloading are different. So loading and unloading create a so-called hysteresis loop. Strain rate dependence refers to the fact that the stress-strain relation depends on the rate at which the strain is applied. So together, these properties are seen in materials that are known as viscoelastic, that combine viscous and elastic properties. Other anelastic properties of soft tissues include preconditioning behavior, whereby the results of one test are different from the subsequent test, and strain softening, whereby the results of a test are sensitive to the previous maximum load that's been experienced by the tissue. So let's look separately at some of these different properties. We mentioned that the elastic deformations of most soft tissues are large, large enough that we must use the finite strain tensors. And here are some examples of maximum physiological stretches that you could expect to see in different tissues. In the lung, a stretch of 100% uh, would not be unphysiological. In heart muscle, the thickening of the ventricular walls can be as high as 50% during systole. Uh, the mesentery can stretch by over 100%, perhaps as much as 200%. Ureter, arteries, and veins uh, can ex extend by 60%. Skin can stretch by 40%. And ligaments and tendons in the range of 2 to 10%, uh, depending on the particular tissue. So these are all relatively large insofar as the Cauchy infinitesimal strain tensor is not a good approximation, and the stress-strain relation over this range of strains is unlikely to be linear. So another important property of soft tissues is that this stress-strain relationship tends to be non-linear. So here you see a typical non-linear stress-strain curve, uh, this for a, a ligament. And for many soft tissues, the tangent modulus, the slope of this curve, is proportional to the stress. So if there is a linear relationship between the slope of the stress-strain curve and the stress, then we have the differential equation that dt d lambda is proportional to t. In this case, we write equals a times t plus b, where a is the slope and a, b is the intercept of this linear relationship seen in rabbit papillary muscle. Now to integrate this, if we know the stress t at some value of lambda equal to lambda star and call that t star, and the typical case would be that t equals zero when the stretch ratio is one, then we can integrate this differential equation to obtain the exponential at t plus b is equal to c times e to the a lambda. And then we can solve for the constants of by substituting the t star plus b equals c times e a to the a lambda star, which gives us that c equals t star plus b times e to the minus a lambda star. So plugging this back in, we get that t is equal to t star plus b times e to the a lambda minus lambda star minus b. Uh, and in the special case, if we chose that t star was 0 when lambda star was 1, which is a common uh, situation, then we would get that t equals b times e to the a lambda minus 1, all minus 1. Now, usually by definition, we assign the stretch ratio to be 1 when the stress is 0 uh, for a stress-strain relationship. But that is also a point on the curve here, you see, where the stresses can be very low, and thus it could be hard to accurately measure. So often for measurement purposes, we may want to choose a point higher on the curve uh, in order to uh, estimate the parameters of our exponential. So at a particular tear load, for example, we could measure our reference lambda and then subsequently correct that after we've fitted our exponential components so that the stress would be zero when the stretch ratio is 1. So this approximation of an exponential stress-strain relation 
deriving from the observation that the slope of the stress-strain relationship is proportional to the stress. Works very well for cardiac muscle, like in this situation, also for skin and ureter, but not for all other tissues, uh, such as the aorta, which has a lot of elastin and tends to be more linear, and the cornea, which has a very specialized structure. So in the case of the cornea, for example, a power type law where T is proportional to the strain raised to a power, and we have three coefficients here, alpha, beta, and ES, um, that model actually works quite well for the cornea. And here we see values of alpha and beta and the correlation coefficient indicating how well this relationship fits the data for human, rabbit, and bovine cornea. And you can see that in each case, beta here is very close to 2. So in other words, the stress-strain relationship for the cornea is actually fairly well approximated by a quadratic, which is certainly not the case for uh, cardiac muscle or skin uh, or tendons and ligaments. Another important property of soft tissues uh, is that their structure tends to make them anisotropic. For example, ligaments, tendons, and muscles are all fibrous and tend to have greater stiffness and strength along the axes of their fibers. And this leads to uh, the material symmetry approximation of transverse isotropy. Other tissues, such as blood vessels, for example, have different properties along three mutually perpendicular axes, such as the axial, radial, and circumferential axes. These materials are known as orthotropic. Now, because the stress-strain relationship is nonlinear, a consequence of this is that strains in different directions can often have interaction effects on the stress. For example, increasing the pressure in a blood vessel alters the axial stiffness. So therefore, uniaxial tests aren't enough to characterize the properties of nonlinear anisotropic materials. We can't separately measure the properties in one direction and another. We actually have to simultaneously load both directions and uh, measure the properties in both directions at the same time. And so this requires what's called multiaxial testing. A variety of different types of multiaxial test apparatus have been developed, but one of the best known and most versatile is the biaxial test rig shown here. So here is the specimen which is uh, attached to long strings that are attached to pullers. And this is important because by having these strings be long, as the device stretches the tissue, the angle of the strings doesn't change very much, and so the loads remain perpendicular to the edges of the tissue and parallel to these axes. Notice that there are pullers on both sides so that the device can pull the tissue symmetrically and leave the center of the specimen centered. Uh, usually in a biaxial test device like this, the strain in the device is measured by visualizing the displacement of markers in the middle of the specimen away from the tethered edges. And so it's important that that region remain in the middle of the field of view of the camera. So the test device pulls equally in both directions um, to keep the specimen centered, but it doesn't have to pull equally in uh, this direction to this direction. So a variety of different multi-axial stretch ratios can be applied. Force transducers are attached to these strings, and so the forces can be integrated, divided by the cross-sectional area to obtain the stresses. Here is an example of the kind of experimental uh, test measurement that can be made with a device like this, in this case on abdominal skin, where the x-axis is the head-to-tail axis and the y-axis is the lateral axis. Now in this particular experiment, the tissue was stretched in one direction but clamped in the other direction. So the stretch ratio in this experiment is lambda x in, is 1. So in the x direction, the stretch is, there's no stretch. And in the y direction, 
the stretch ratio is increased as shown on this axis. Here the opposite is applied, the tissue is clamped in the y direction and stretched in the x direction. Now this is not the same as leaving the tissue free because if you stretch in one direction it would tend to shrink in the other direction. So this is known as a strip biaxial test. And what you can see immediately from this experiment is that the stress strain curves in the x direction and the y direction are very different. So what you can see from this result is that the stress strain curves are very different uh, in the y-axis perpendicular to the body axis than in, along the x-axis in the head-to-tail axis. Uh, the curve is also more non-linear in the y-axis than in the uh, x-axis. Um, and so there's a big difference in the maximum strain uh, that can be obtained by stretching perpendicular to the body axis than longitudinally to the body axis. Another important property of soft tissues is that they are inhomogeneous. This means that the mechanical properties vary from place to place in the tissue. An excellent example are blood vessels that have three structurally different layers with different properties. The outer layer is called the adventitia and consists primarily of connective tissues like collagen and elastin. The middle layer, or media, is the muscular layer and is where the smooth muscle cells are concentrated. The inner layer, or intima, is a single layer of endothelial cells. This layer is important for the way that blood vessels respond to mechanical stresses and the way that they respond to stimuli that stimulate contraction. Uh, but mechanically, this layer doesn't contribute much to the stress in the vessel. Properties also vary along the arterial tree, from the ascending aorta, for example, which is high in elastin and low in smooth muscle, uh, to the abdominal aorta, which has less elastin and tends to be more nonlinear as a result, to the arterioles, which have a thicker intima and more smooth muscle and tend to be more viscoelastic and have more hysteresis as a result. Creep and relaxation are anelastic properties. Creep is the strain response that occurs over time to a step change in the stress. So here's an example of a measured creep response to a step change in load applied to uh, a papillary muscle from a rabbit heart. Now, this is on a log scale, so what looks like a straight line is actually a decaying exponential in time. And so what you can see is that instantaneously upon application of the load, the strain increased to about 2%. However, over the next 0.1 minutes, so 6 seconds, it nearly doubled to 4%. And then over the following uh, minute, it increased again. And by several hours, uh, the tissue had uh, extended many times the original strain. So this property is known as creep, uh, and the rate of creep is highest uh, in the first short period after the application of the load, and then uh, it exponentially slows down. The converse experiment is stress relaxation. This is the stress response over time to a step change in the strain. And again, we see an exponential kind of response. So here we see the stress in coronary artery subjected to a step in strain. You see, initially the stress rises, but then rapidly at first and then more slowly, the stress decays or relaxes uh, over the period of uh, the next 20 or 30 minutes. So creep and relaxation are both examples of viscoelastic properties. They are not seen in a purely elastic material, but if you include some viscous fluid-like properties in the model, then a viscoelastic material model can produce creep and relaxation. Two other examples of viscoelastic uh, 
time history dependent properties, are hysteresis and strain rate dependence. So hysteresis refers to the fact that the loop of loading and unloading is not the same, and the area of the loop represents the uh, dissipation of energy. Um, what we see is that the stress-strain curve and the hysteresis loop, here again shown in rabbit papillary muscle uh, with the axes switched, uh, that, that curve also depends somewhat on the rate at which this tissue is loaded and unloaded. However, the changes in the stress-strain curve and the hysteresis loop with changes in strain rate are relatively small, or to put it another way, very large changes in strain rate are needed to see uh, significant changes in the stress-strain loop. So here, for example, we see a two-order of magnitude change in strain rate from 0.09% per second for this curve to 9% per second for this curve. So you can see that as the strain rate increases, the strain decreases for a given load, so the tissue gets a little stiffer, the hysteresis loop gets a little bit smaller. But these, these require two orders of magnitude difference in strain rate in order to see these differences. So for typical physiological range, ranges of strain rate, the uh, effect of strain rate on the stress-strain relationship is typically fairly minor. Now the degree of hysteresis, the area of the hysteresis loop, varies between tissues uh, from a relatively minor, as you see here in vena cava or in tendons and ligaments, uh, to much larger. Here you see it's somewhat larger in the uh, cardiac muscle and in tissues that have a lot of smooth muscle, except for example, like the intestines, uh, it's even higher. Some other anelastic properties that are common to soft tissues include preconditioning behavior and strain softening. Preconditioning behavior refers to the property of soft tissues whereby the stress-strain loop changes with successive cycles of loading and unloading, but eventually becomes repeatable i.e. preconditioned when enough repetitions have been performed. Here we can see preconditioning behavior during uniaxial uh, stress strain testing of bovine coronary artery and the numbers here represent the sequence of loading and unloading uh, that was performed on this tissue. You can see the very first load cycle had a particularly large hysteresis loop and then the second cycle, the up curve was significantly to, right, to the right of the first time, and the hysteresis loop was somewhat smaller. Then in subsequent cycles, you can see that the stretch is even a little bit greater, and so the curves moved a little bit more to the right, and then in the subsequent curve, a little bit further. But with each successive loading and unloading cycle, the curves get closer and closer together, so that by somewhere between five and 15 repetitions, the stress-strain hysteresis loop has become reproducible. Typically, this preconditioning behavior results in the tissue being both softer and the hysteresis loop being somewhat smaller, but the hysteresis loop doesn't altogether disappear. So the preconditioned tissue still has hysteresis, it's just that one hysteresis loop and the next one are practically indistinguishable. So this is important in experimental testing of soft tissues and it's normal protocol to perform repeated cycling of loading and unloading to ensure that the tissue is preconditioned uh, in reporting of stress strain behavior in soft tissues. And the reasoning for this is in part that tissues in vivo are more likely to be in their preconditioned natural uh, regularly loaded state than in the state that they are when they're freshly excised. Now, another anelastic property that contributes in part to preconditioning is called strain softening or the Mullins effect. This is the property of uh, materials including rubber and polymers where the first time it is loaded, 
to a new maximum load, it's stiffer than the second and subsequent times. And this is seen, for example, when you blow up a new balloon. The first time you blow it up is much harder to inflate than the second and subsequent times. Now, strain softening actually refers to the first time that the material is loaded to a new maximum strain. Uh, and so here you can see in uh, guinea pig jejunum that the first time it was inflated to a pressure of 3. So here we see in uh, guinea pig jejunum, for example, that at new maximum uh, inflation pressures of 3, 6, 9, 12, 15 millimeters of mercury, the stress-strain loop is significantly softened, and so this softening behavior is called the Mullins effect, or strain softening. Now, strain softening is generally thought to reflect some sort of material damage, but in soft tissues, this seems to be a natural property that is reversible given enough time. So it's not necessarily a permanent damage, and it may not even be an injury. So this is probably the sort of thing you do to your connective tissues when you stretch before exercising.